Good afternoon. I am delighted to welcome you to the Edwin M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. Isn't this a fabulous room? We have our own full-scale replica of the Senate chamber, and you're able to sit on the seats and be uh, senators for a day, but OTSI senators today. Um, my name is Jean McCormick, and I have the great privilege of being the president of the Institute. We're delighted to have you here today, and if this is your first visit, I certainly hope that it won't be your last. Please come back and, and be able to see our exhibits and our chamber programs. We want this really to be a gathering place for the community to see our exhibits, to participate in our programs, and to renew their commitment to be active, engaged citizens. When Senator Kennedy dreamed up this idea of the Institute, he was clear that it should be of the Senate, but not solely about the Senate. He wanted the crown jewel, this chamber, to be a place where, your, where students of all ages could debate, negotiate, and find common ground. But he didn't want this room and this building to only be a place where laws are studied and debated are only for politicians. He wanted it to be a living, breathing monument to our democracy, a place where ideas come alive where historians, musicians, and yes, novelists, can gather, meet members of our community, and share their ideas. It is in the sharing of diverse ideas that democracy really thrives. In our brief history already, this chamber has hosted presidents, senators, governors, and today, for the first time, Pulitzer Prize winning authors. We are hosting this event today to mark the National Arts and Education Week and Hispanic Heritage Month. This will be the first of many events we hope to do that will celebrate various heritages. You know, Senator Kennedy, this might not be something that you all know, was an avid painter. You can see some of his paintings in his replica of the, his office. He was one of the few senators to ever employ a full-time staff member completely dedicated to arts issues. And he was a passionate champion of the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities. We here at the Institute share Senator Kennedy's commitment to and passion for the arts, which is why we are so thrilled today to welcome our speaker. Junot Diaz's fiction has appeared in the New Yorker, the Paris Review, and Best American Short Stories. His debut book, Drown, was a national bestseller and earned him a Penn Malamud Award. His, de his debut novel, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize. But we are particularly thrilled to welcome him here today because of his work with the Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation, which he co-founded in 1999. The mission of Vona is to develop emerging writers of color through programs and workshops taught by established writers of color. By encouraging emerging writers to share their stories, commit to social justice, and engage in their communities, Vona is encouraging writers to make their communities better places, an idea we certainly support here at the Institute. Born in the Dominican Republic and raised in New Jersey, Mr. Diaz lives in New York City and is the Raj and Nancy Allen Professor of Writing at MIT right here in Cambridge. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Juno Diaz. Thank you, very kind. Huh, so there's, because I have this on, I could go anywhere or is it? But we're taping this for live stream, right? Yeah, yeah so you don't wanna jump around too much. Uh, anyway, 
Guys, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, I wanted to have, thank the Institute for having me. Um, it's really a tremendous honor to be here at the Kennedy Institute. Uh, it was almost impossible to find. Did anybody else? <laughs> that construction. It's, uh, this neck of the woods, I've been coming here for a really long time. I had a friend who came here in the early 2000s to get a master's degree. And I don't think I, we've ever stopped being lost. So I wanted to thank the Institute. I want to thank you all for coming out. I can't believe it. You must have been listening to the game on the ride in, yeah? Some of you were probably a little worried. Yeah, so I'm very grateful for you all being here. I wanted to thank uh, all the staff who made this evening possible. Uh, as you can imagine, sort of a ton of work goes into this, so very grateful for all the folks who did all that kind of necessary invisible work uh, to make this little ship launch. And of course, I want to thank our translator. As you can imagine, uh, the sort of work that is about to be done over the next hour and 10 minutes uh, will be far more than I'm going to do up here. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Um, I have one question, though. My curiosity is endless, which is, what is the uh, sign for New Jersey? <laughs> Not bad. <yeah. laughs> Not bad, very Hawaiian-esque in the stereotype, yeah? Okay, well, that's cool. Um, and I guess, you know, kind of just see if we can uh, get a sense of folks who are here. Um, we're in the middle of an election campaign where certain issues are clearly on the front burner. And so I'm very curious, uh, are there any immigrants in the room whatsoever? Yeah? They're like, what? Immigrants, yo. Any immigrants in the room? <laughs> Very silent, though. No applause, usually. Mm. How about any Latinos in the room? Yo, Trump's coming for us, yo. <laughs> Extraordinary, man. It's extraordinary. When it comes to white supremacy, the concept between citizen and undocumented, that line is completely erased. Yeah? So it's an extraordinary thing. We're, we're, for those of us who are new to these kinds of election cycles, this brings me right back to the 80s. Yeah? The kind of demonic discourse that's being mobilized against communities of color and against poor folks and against immigrant folks and really focused on the Latino community. It's really kind of extraordinary. It's like Latinos are in the same place with the Muslim community, where anyone can say absolutely anything in a public forum and get away with it. And the imagination, of course, is that there is no cost to this. The imagination is that, well, given the sort of structural place where this community is at, vis-a-vis -vis voting, et cetera. There's not really any back end to this. I can make the wildest claims about this community. I can direct some of the most odious calumny at this community, and it's going to pass muster. I can still be elected president. And it's really kind of an extraordinary thing to be able to be in a time and a place where someone can ab just absolutely demonize the largest, yeah, quote unquote, minority community of the country and still have a very good chance to be elected president. Yeah, we've got a, a, a ways yet to come. But given what I see in organization, see what I, given what I see in the kind of community work, given what I see in the kind of young people we have, I, I'm always have an enormous amount of faith. You know? I mean, we've toppled worse assholes than Trump. So he's just another one who's looking for a lumpen, you know? And so we're more than happy to give it to him. More than happy to give it to him. And so that's what I was thinking about today on the ride over. I couldn't help it. Yeah, the game was on. But also the election just never stops. For those of us who are from the Dominican Republic, are we, do we have any Dominicans here at all? Yeah. I feel like, uh, the United States has becoming more and more like the Dominican Republic in ways that I never would have imagined. Where, you know, in Santo Domingo, the election cycles basically 
12 months a year. Uh, campaigns just don't stop. And it's become that way in the United States in some ways, you know? And then, of course, all the stuff that happened around the politics of denationalization in the Dominican Republic, right? A couple months ago, you know, and until today, but starting many, many years ago, the Dominican Republic began this whole policy around this whole idea of reimagining and rewriting and really rereading its constitution to sort of denationalize a part of its own community, its own citizenship. And, you know, when we were dealing with this, those of us who were critical of this, who were organizing against this, what was interesting was that this just seemed like some crazy malignity of a political party in the Dominican Republic that has more or less captured the state really through an enormous amount of corruption and an enormous amount of clientelism and in a, with a lot of anti-democratic moves. I thought, okay, this was a localized situation. And then, of course, you see the Republican Party pushing to be the, I call them the, you know, they're pushing to be the sub-Dominicans. They're like the sub PLD. They're looking to <laughs> reimagine the Constitution in a way that gets rid of birthright citizenship. And we're really, it's strange how a lot of the xenophobic, anti-immigrant politics feed each other across borders. You know, I used to think of these things as far more localized, but xenophobia has become transnational in ways I think that it's hard to capture or that many of us are still trying to catch up to. Anyway, that's my rant and roll before I start to read. Yeah, sort of very straight. No, no need for applause. It's just we're, we're in a bizarre. We're sort of in a bizarre time, and I'm kind of a, I'm sort of a kind of a bad writer in that way. I, I, I just always felt that I, I grew up in a sort of a weird period. Um, I'm one of those kids who immigrated to the United States right as. You know, Saigon was collapsing. You know, so my first months in the United States, all that was on was the last few months as southern Vietnam was falling. And then, of course, I came of age during the Central American, the genocidal Central American wars. You know, and in our community, we had people flooding in from those wars, yeah? All that kind of U.S.-backed madness that gets inflicted in Central America. That was like my childhood. And then, of course, Reagan and the anti-apartheid movement, which had such a tremendous impact on me when I was a kid. When you're like 12 and 13 and you have like neighbors in the anti-apartheid movement and you see that politics, I think that that in some ways kind of rewired my goddamn brain. Sometimes wonder, it's like, you know, I sometimes wonder if there was I just sometimes wonder about that, you know? If it was just a matter of personal curiosity, where it was the fact that where I grew up, you couldn't escape that torrent of sort of political content. Anyway, I'm gonna read a small section, and then we're gonna open it up for questions, yeah? Yeah? <laughs> you guys have some things to talk about? I hope so. All right, yeah. Just read one quick one, um, and we're done. Uh, this is from my novel, the only novel, uh, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. Don't need to know much about it. Uh, it's, this is a second person. It's the you in this story is a young Dominican teenager living in Patterson with her mom. Yeah, so I'm gonna move a little. Come out away from this. I really can't help. It really, oh, it's that thing isn't, I didn't turn it on. No, that was me. <laughs> cool. I turned it on. It's all right, sorry. Yeah. So here we go. Um, it's never the changes we want that change everything. 
This is how it all starts with your mother calling you into the bathroom. You will remember what you were doing at that precise moment for the rest of your life. You were reading Watership Down, and the rabbits were making their dash for the boat, and you did not want to stop reading. But then your mother called again, louder, her I am not fucking around voice, and you mumbled irritably, si, senora. Your mother was standing in front of the medicine cabinet mirror, naked from the waist up, her bra slung around her like a torn sail. The scar on her back as vast and inconsolable as a sea. You want to return to your book to pretend that you had not heard her, but it is too late. Her eyes meet yours, the same big smoky eyes that you will have in the future. Bang akka she commands. Your mother is frowning at something on one of her breasts. For the record, your mother's breasts are immensities, one of the wonders of the world, yeah? The only ones that you're seeing that are bigger are in nudie magazines and on really fat ladies. They are 36 triple Ds, and the Oreolas are as big as saucers and as black as pitch, and at their edges are fierce little hairs that sometimes your mother plucks and sometimes she does not. These breasts have always embarrassed you and when you walk in public with her, you are always conscious of them. After her face and her hair, her chest is what she is most proud of. Your father, your mother likes to brag, could never get enough of these, <laughs> but Given the fact that he ran off on her in their third year of marriage, it seemed in the end he could, yeah? <laughs> you dread conversations with your mother, those one-sided dressing downs. You figure that your mother has called you in to give you another earful about your diet. You see, your mother's convinced that if you eat more platanos, you will suddenly acquire her same extraordinary train-wrecking secondary sex characteristics. Even at that age, you were nothing if not your mother's daughter. You were 12 years old and already as tall as she was, a long, slender-necked ibis of a girl. You had her green eyes, clearer though, and her straight hair, which makes you look more Hindu than Dominican and a behind that the boys have not been able to stop talking about since the fifth grade, but whose appeal you do not yet understand. You have her complexion too, which means that you are dark. But for all of your similarities, the tides of inheritance have yet to reach your chest. You have only the slightest hint of breasts. From most angles, you're as flat as a board, and you are thinking that your mother is going to order you to stop wearing bras again, because in her words, they are suffocating your breasts, discouraging, suffocating your potential breasts, discouraging them from developing. You are ready to argue with your mother to the death because you're as possessive of your bras as you are of the pads that you can now buy yourself. But no, your mother does not say a word about eating more platanos. Instead, she takes your hand and guides you your mother is rough in all things, but this time she is gentle. You did not think her capable of it. Do you feel that, she asks you. At first, all you feel is the heat of her and the density of that tissue like a bread that has never stopped rising. She kneads your fingers into her. You're as close as the two of you have ever been, and her breathing is what you will remember. Don't you feel that? She turns towards you. Coño, muchacha del diablo, stop looking at me. And feel. So you close your eyes, and your fingers are pushing down, and of course you're thinking of Helen Keller, and how when you were a little girl you wanted to be just like Helen Keller, except a little bit more nunnish, and then suddenly, without warning, you do feel something. 
a knot just beneath her skin, tight and secretive as a plot. And at that moment, for reasons you will never quite understand, you are overcome by the feeling, the premonition that something in your life is about to change. You become lightheaded, you can feel a throbbing in your blood, bright light zoom you through zoom through you like photon torpedoes, like comets. You do not know how or why you know this thing, but that you know it cannot be doubted. It is exhilarating. For as long as you have been alive, you have had bruja ways. Even your mother will begrudge you that much. E had a liborio, she called you after you picked your tia's winning numbers for her. And you assumed liborio was a relative. That was before you started going back to Santo Domingo, before you found out about the great power of God. I feel it, you say too loudly. Lo siento. And like that, everything changes. Before the winter is out, the doctors remove the breasts that you were needing, along with the axillary lymph node. Because of the operation, your mother will have trouble lifting her arm over her head for the rest of her life. Her hair begins to fall out, and one day she pulls all that remains out herself and puts it inside of a plastic bag. You change too. Not right away, but it happens. And it is in that bathroom where it all begins, where you begin. That's it. Thank you. So, uh, let's, uh, let's do some questions, yeah? We'll take a break, so you don't have to listen to me completely. Is that a question? It is a question. I'm not sure that I have. Mics are going to come running. I'm so messed up, man. I got in my car and I was ready to come here and I realized I was wearing a t-shirt and somebody sent me a picture of this shit <laughs> and I went upstairs and immediately got this shit on because I was like, fuck, you know? And then I came back down and I forgot my damn car keys, so I'm so thinking of y'all, yeah. Um, so I have a quick comment and just to be... Oh no, not comments. <laughs> And a quick question. So my comment is really, um, it's a great honor to meet you. And uh, my comment is really to thank you for, um, I guess, not shying away from provocative um, issues. And I, I think we just saw an example of that when you were talking about Trump. But um, I, I think that as someone that, that digs your work and is a fan, I am particularly proud to say that um, that I follow you when I hear you take a stand on issues, especially those related to race, race relations, and human injustices. It makes me very proud to hear you speak against the discriminatory immigration practices going on in Santo Domingo. So I just want to thank you and let you know that we're watching and we're proud of you. So that's my oh, comment. Thank you. Yeah, well, you guys are kind. You, you guys are very kind, thank you. Um, and so my question is, uh, I'm thinking about your formation as an author and um, you're co-founding this Voices of Art Nation workshop. Can you talk a little bit about the drive to create that and um, I guess the importance of creating spaces where um, writers from underrepresented communities can identify professionally with, with people that can train them and did you have that when you were um, an amateur, I guess? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess part of this all goes into, the, um, goes into the whole kind of sense of civic responsibility, like that's the term, right? Like what's one civic imaginary, you know, like what does one think one owes a society? And I've always been one of these kids, I, like a lot of people from where I grew up in, we grew up super poor, plenty of people poorer, you know, but I think about my mom, she was like raising five kids on $6,000 a year in 1983, which was not a lot of money, you know? So we were broke, but again, there were people in our town who were a lot broker, 
who didn't even have like a mom. And part of me was even in that context, I was so aware of my vast privilege. You know, we were in section eight, we were receiving fucking food stamps. Again, my brother and I, I think had two pants that we shared. Like for real, that's like super humiliation. And um, especially when you're a teenager, you know, it's like body blows to your self-esteem in some ways, you know? Um, but even at that time, I was really aware that, that there were so many kids that I like on my block, so many kids that I was like getting on the bus with who had it way worse than me. And um, I don't know what happened, but like part of my head got twisted somewhere along the line because it's, I'm always looking downhill, it seems, you know? I'm always thinking like, shit, man, I'm glad I'm not this fucked up. But then the second reaction is, well, that means you've got to do something. You've got to try to help people. So I always feel like that comes out of that impulse, you know? Um, I always feel like, you know, shit, I had a lot of stuff even when we didn't have much. And I think that whether we're talking about the kind of community work I do with writers of color, or we're talking about the kind of organizing I do for immigrant rights. Um, for me, it just comes from that. I always feel like, shit, I owe so much, it's embarrassing. And I think it's, it's possible to be aware of one's oppression and to be aware of how one is, belongs to a community that's constantly disenfranchised, that's constantly being assaulted, but simultaneously be able to toggle back with there's still debts owed. And I think a lot of that comes from that. And the second part of the question, I just, again, I think that whether one is a student of color at a university or you're some other group that doesn't ever, hasn't ever felt safe in certain kinds of spaces that has been kind of structurally discriminated against. One of the few answers to that kind of plight, in other words, if you're the only X kind of kid in Y program, how the hell do you survive it? When most people, A, aren't feeling your reality, deny the forces that made you possible and are actively often hostile to the kind of awareness and knowledge that you bring and coming from this experience, the only answer that has been useful for me, the only response to surviving in those environments is collectivity. In other words, you can't do this alone. You've got to bond with people, even if you're not a friendly type person. I mean, shit, I'm not a writer because I'm super outgoing. I, fuck, man, I like to be locked up in a room for months, dude. That's not like a positive sign, yo, that <laughs> you're a fucking sunny dude. But I still know that this is, this is a necessity that you got to pull together. And the more that you work on your collectivity muscle, because it's a muscle, you know, you know as well as I do, you guys know as well as I do, que los seres humanos no son fácil. Los seres humanos son malito complicado, man. And if people aren't easy, you often know of, that many times when we attempt to form collectivity, we often get rejected. We often get discouraged. We often get demotivated because it's not easy. And just keeping that muscle working and keep trying was important to me because I may not have had writing mentors, but I had a lot of collectivity as an activist and as a person of African descent, as a Caribbean, you know, as an immigrant, as a Dominican, I had a lot of collectivity and that shit saved me. What, you know, I've never been saved by wrapping my flag around myself. If you're an immigrant, I always think that way lies madness and kind of false nationalism that sometimes gets mobilized because that's easier than some more complicated forms of, you know, of identification. But definitely community has been a huge saver. So I've always wanted that. The few times I've had it, it saved my life. And I want to increase people's, whatever I can do, opportunities for people to have that. Thank you. Man, tough question. Let's get the easy one, yo. <laughs> Feel like, why you suck? That's the better one. Do we have something up top? I see like chins. <laughs> Do you guys have desks too or no? Because these people look like they should be fucking taking notes. 
<laughs> For real, I'm up here, I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> there must be a question. Okay, I see a hand. So I think somebody's coming around. Oh. Hi. My question is pretty simple. So um, with everything that you've said, what are things that truly inspire you? Because I can imagine as a writer, there's probably many subjects and many situations that you know, can serve as fodder for writing. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm still, you know, it's, I'm not very imaginative. I feel if I was more imaginative, I'd have like way many more books, you know? I'm still kind of trying to unravel like the, the sort of childhood and youth I had. Like, I'm, in my mind, I'm really curious about what it meant. I grew up in central Jersey, and I grew up in what would, for if you were a Dominican who grew up in Lawrence, or if you're a Dominican who grew up in Washington Heights, how I grew up would seem really alien to you. Like, I grew up in a community that was like some old science fiction experiment where it was like equal parts, like African-American, equal parts, other Latino groups. So I grew up with like Cubans, and I grew up with Puerto Ricans, Maboriquas, and I grew up with Colombians. And then there were Asian immigrants. So I grew up with a ton of fucking Pinoy, ton of Filipinos. I grew up with a bunch of North Africans, folks from Egypt and stuff. And we all grew up in this one ill pit. And then, of course, it was Jersey. And you had all these other communities. Like, I grew up around one of the largest Korean communities outside of, like, New York and L.A. And so, kind of growing up in that world, that really still in my mind, trying to figure out ways to explain that. You know, and, and how, do you explain, how do you explain my kind of crazy family? And so, if anything inspires me, it's this weird life that I still don't know how to put my hands around. But in today, now, I just, honestly, whenever I hang out, I have to tell you, anytime I hang out with Dominicans, Caribbeans, immigrants of any kind, people of African descent, that life energy that made us possible, which so many of us carry, you know, invincibly, that, constant, that spurs me all the time. I just, 15 minutes of hanging out with people and I just, I'm like, this here is the true center of all art. That's what it feels like in my heart. You know, people who for centuries were not meant to have survived. And yet here we are, like extraordinary in our sobrevivencia. That's, that's, deep i love that you know and men causing mad trouble that shit is also fun yo <laughs> yeah man cheating men i don't know why i love writing about them you know <laughs> anyway that's that so we have a question over here okay i think we do is this young person right here they, they're coming for you no no they're coming oh um, yeah you were recently um written in the paper that um by taking a stand against the, what uh, Dominicans were doing to people born in Haiti, um, certain threats were uh, made. And what, what did that feel like to e exercise common sense or what you thought was common decency and be threatened um, in response to that? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, on the internet, it's mad easy for people to wake up and just be like, I need to discharge my psychic bullshit, and I'm just gonna be like, I hope you fucking die, you traitor to the Dominican nation. <laughs> you know? All Haitians must burn, especially the number one Haitian traitor, Juno Diaz. Like, it's easy for people to wake up and do that. But you gotta understand, like, there's a lot of folks in Santo Domingo who are on the ground fighting this fight, and they're, let's just say that they have a lot more exposure to threats, that they're risking way more than someone like me. I mean, you know, I wake up in the morning, so what? There's like a bunch of emails in the morning and people are like, die. I mean, <laughs> but what can you do? It's like, I, first of all, I, I can't be anyone else. You have your conscience and I have mine. 
and I'm an immigrant from the Dominican Republic of African descent who came up in this country and saw an enormous amount of discrimination against Dominicans. I fought tooth and nail, not only against white folks, against other Latinos, other folks of African descent, other immigrants, to be recognized as a member of a community that's fully human. Because a lot of people, when I was growing up, Dominicans weren't human beings. You just have to open the newspaper and be like, Dominicans were basically, you know, basically a homologous with drug dealer. We were in human, we were in a real community, and I fought that my whole life, and I'm just, I have my conscience, man. I'm like, this shit isn't right. I don't care all of the obfuscatory rhetoric. I don't care about all the bullshit claims to nationalism. I don't care about all your sophistry and all these attempts to defend, you know, denationalizing a group of Dominicans, I don't give a fuck. My conscience says no. And I'm not going to live any other way right now. Maybe in the future, something in my spirit will change and I will cave. It is possible. But right now, no fucking way. My conscience says no. And I can't be another person. Because that's when you discover who you really are, is when your conscious draws the line, you know? And again, it's not anything particularly courageous. You don't actually do much calculus around it. You just wake up and you're like, no, fuck no, that's that. And uh, yeah, whatever. I mean, for me, the problem isn't me. The problem isn't what I say. The problem isn't what I'm experiencing. The problem isn't any emails. For me, the problem is these politics and a very corrupt political party that's mobilizing it. And a community that is captured by a media system that doesn't permit any dissenting voices. If there was an, an enormous range of dissenting media in the Dominican Republic, if you know, two thirds of the jobs, of the good paying jobs in the Dominican Republic weren't handing, being handed out by the political party that is masterminding this politics, I think we would see a different discussion. And so I, I, you know, I, I understand that things on the ground are really complicated, but the real issue isn't me, the real issue is what these policies are doing, and the folks who are leading this fight, Ana Maria Belik, folks like that, they're the ones who are like, I can't believe they have the courage, because I'm not sure if I was hanging out in Santo Domingo 24 seven, and that was my, life that I would be so quick to have a conscious. You know, that's it's not easy. And they, for me, are the real, like, people who are doing this work. Something else up top? Cool, just making sure, you know. I don't want to deny. Is that a hand over there? I think we'll just go there. It's just that because they get forgotten. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the climate in Boston in regards to gentrification. Oh, I grew damn, what's with you guys, yo? <laughs> what the fuck? Well, okay, but... Um, How do you make characters? <laughs> Shoot. What books do you read? <laughs> Please, continue, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I, I grew up in Somerville in the 80s and 90s, and it was a much different climate than it is today, and yet I look the way that I look, and I realize when I talk about gentrification passionately, it looks hypocritical maybe, but it's not. Damn white people, is that what you mean? Because. <laughs> you were like the white people. Because I've had the benefits of looking the way that I do, but also growing up in a immensely diverse neighborhood. And that I think going forward is something that I've had to weighing down in certain populations and get through college in a certain ways, but also now that I'm in my 30s, know that it was an immense blessing to grow around, to be able to come across adversity and live and work with different kinds of people. And I know that you've been critical of Boston in the past, and are you hopeful for the future? What do, what do you think? I don't know, how, how does it, how do you look? How, how does it feel when you're at MIT? and? You see the people that you do and right. those things. Okay. Well, I mean, first things first, nobody, I, 
I rarely find folks who come from the social justice community who aren't like profoundly optimistic. You got to be an optimistic cat to think you can bring justice to anything, <laughs> given how monkey ass human beings are, man. <laughs> human beings are on some straight up monkey shit. The idea that you can improve anything that humans do, you got to be a magical thinking motherfucker. You know, so promise most, not all, but most social justice people are deeply, deeply optimistic. We're like, yay, we can do this. Um, you know, and I mean, I think, look, here's the deal when it comes to what I think about cities and when I think about the kind of shit you're seeing in Boston and Cambridge, this kind of really rapid gentrification, the ways that our diverse communities are being completely pushed away and pushed out. And, uh, you know, the kind of stuff everybody's seeing on the ground, the reason you're paying so much for fucking rent. You know, and if you own a property and you got that shit paid off, you're like, you know, but the rest of everybody else is like, fuck. I think, you know, look, I think that, I think that we're, our politics have gotten super strange. They're super strange because... Guys, the rain has started. The ark is not built yet. And if all our politics are not aimed at creating affordable housing by any means we can, there's a serious problem. And I think that it's really weird in Cambridge where we have like supposedly some super liberal city council members who voted against affordable housing. They were like, no, we don't want these 40 units of affordable housing because we are opposed to the other 100 units of upper end housing that would be built along with it because we're worried about density. Hmm. In a perfect world, where poor people weren't all going to be pushed out in three or four years, that would be a wonderful conversation to have. But when you get 40 families in affordable housing, that's a community. And it's easy when you've got your apartment to play politics with this idea that like, oh, well, 40 units of housing, that's a drop in the bucket. Well, it is to you because you've got your nice fucking apartment and you've got your little MIT degree, or you sold your house at market value, and you got a ton of money, but you've got this other thing going on. And I think, yo, know, we've got some fucked up shit going on where people are not understanding that every single unit of affordable housing that we get saves one family. And that's it. And if you have a problem with density, then why don't you open your fucking apartment to people? Because for me, the argument of density is always people who've already got their shit. They're like, I'm in my house and I'm worried about density, which is code word for I'm worried about getting any more people of color up in this piece. I don't want to hear about housing from people who have houses. <laughs> if you have a house, if you have a house, if you have a house, you should have no fucking say on how much and way and how we build affordable housing. It is a conflict of interest. But yet when you go to these affordable housing meetings, everybody who's speaking is sitting on a two or three million dollar property talking about how oh, we're worried about density. I want to hear all the families who don't have housing all the families who are paying outrageous amounts, they're the ones I want to hear about whether 40 units of housing is a good idea or not. And I think that we've got to stop with this bullshit just because somebody talks the good liberal game. My question to anybody in office is, how much housing did you personally get built this year? For me, that's the essential issue because in three or four years, 
none of us are going to be left in this town. And if we don't get this shit done now, you think in seven years there's going to be any people of color, any poor people, any artists? Anyway, that's my shit. Next question. <laughs> this young person. This is like a young person. Are you in high school? No, I'm in Sorry. sixth grade. Damn, yo. <laughs> I like have an easy question. Thank you. What was your inspiration for being a writer? Did you just like, oh, I'm going to be a writer. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't grow up in the time. You know, these days, like a lot of people want to be writers because they see like, the woman who wrote Harry Potter, and they're just like, yo, this chick lives in a fucking castle. And they're like, I, I want to be a writer, yo. When I grew up, there was like none of that. I didn't know any writer who was rich. Like, I just, they all seemed dead. I was like, you would read their books, and they're like, oh, they're fucking dead, I, but I like them, you know? I think for me, the, the reason I wanted to become a writer was because I fucking love reading. Being a writer is, I, I don't actually like writing that much. What I really love is reading. So I always say this, being a writer is just an excuse to read full time. And if I liked reading less, I would write way more. Like I've written three books only, and I have friends who started publishing at the same time as me, and they've written eight books. And that's because like I read way too much. So that's it. And if you love books, I think what you mean by that is that you love the way books transform us. You love the way books put us in contact with ourselves. You love the way books allow us to feel what someone in another time and space may have felt. You love how books can contain in them wisdom, can contain in them argument, can contain in them grief, can contain in them joy. And I loved reading, man, so it was mostly that. And nobody was writing about the Dominicans I grew up with, so I was like, my bad writing is better than no writing. So, do we have time for like two more questions and we're almost done, yeah? There's a question here, yes? Hmm? Oh, somebody had their hand up a long time? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't see shit, guys, so. I'm not actually picking on you and be like, that's my fucking neighbor. I hate him. No. <laughs> Let's have this question. I can, I can give it. No, no. We'll do oh, it. Okay. Um, being Dominican and, and the way I hear you speak with the swear and all that, and, and I'm good with, with that, but it's a pure Dominican that's not part of the culture. Are you exploding for the resistance, the restraint that your mother told you never to swear and now you're giving it all? Yeah, no, that's a great question. No, that's actually a great question. It's not Dominican. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, I, I guess here's my argument on this, is if, I don't know how you grew up, because I, everybody grows up very differently, but if I subtracted curse words from the Dominican Spanish I grew up with, there might have been 10 words left over. <laughs> so I grew up with... Coño, muchacho del diablo, hijo de la gran puta, este fucking maldito fucking culo, ese mama huevo, diantre. I grew up with all that shit nonstop. And my, my thing was is that, look, everybody who's a parent knows what you say and what you practice are very visible to young people. So I grew up with my parents say, don't curse, hijo de la gran puta, coño. A ti yo te voy a romper, yo te puta, coño, yo te voy a quitar la cabeza. You grew up with that. And then they're like, pero aquí no se usa mala palabra. <laughs> eh, aquí nosotros somos gente culta, muy civilizado. El abuelo tuyo estudió, era hombre fino, hijo de la gran puta, coño, yo te voy a matar. So, Part of the problem was the hypocrisy of what language was permitted, and part of the problem, which isn't exactly visible to most people, most people don't know that like, I worked all the way through college, I worked all the way through high school, I always had a very difficult industrial type job, 
I grew up much more deeply in the working poor than I grew up in the kind of poor kid who went to college. So imagine, I grew up delivering pool tables, I grew up working in a steel mill, I grew up working at a gas station. I spent more time in my working class immigrant jobs than I did at the university. And when you grow up with males in that environment, you get one language. You know, at least in my mind, I had one language. And I could talk as white and as nice as anybody if I wanted to, <laughs> but this isn't the job. No, this isn't, I just, and my poor mom, no, I, I you know, it's, it's bad. My poor mom is super upset. Most people are like, yo, fuck you. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Aquí estaban preocupados por ti, man. They were worried, man. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you for um, everything so far. Um, I guess my question is not too far off on the last one, but for some context, I'm from Everett, which is uh, north side of the city. Uh, I went to Everett High School, and the way we speak, me and my friends and whatnot, it's, it's similar to how you're speaking here at the EMK, but um, I go to BU now. And I felt like I went to a different country, a different planet when you I did. went 10, yeah, 10 minutes away from my house. You did. Uh, my question for you, as a Pulitzer Prize, you know, author, someone that's speaking right now at the EMK Institute, you know, that type of language isn't, va it's not valued, you know, the way of the means of expression that come about with that language, it's not really valued here and by no means in academia. So my question for you is how did you, you know, hold on to your streetness, so to speak, while going through the ivory tower that is academia, you know what I mean? Well, but I mean, part of this is, it's, again, I think this is a great and complicated question, and I just, we, only have, we don't have any time, and so I, I, I'll give a very short answer to this, but I feel like that's a question that there's more to it than this. You know, I'm an immigrant, I'm sure most people here, a lot of immigrants here, and gang, like, I learned very quickly that I didn't speak Spanish to people who didn't speak Spanish. Like, that was a lost cause. Right? And I learned very quickly not to speak English to people who didn't speak English. And I think what I ended up learning was, I, like many of us, when we immigrate to university, is that one has to master the codes over there. You know, you could say, I don't want to master the codes, but why would you lose an opportunity to gain a literacy? For me, it's just a literacy. It's not great, but it's a literacy. You know, you learn to speak a language. And I learned to speak English. After that, the rest of it seemed easy. And I guess part of me was that, like, I learned how to speak. After four years of dealing in college, I learned how to speak that language. Depending on what space, you select the language you want to use. Yeah. And I think most of us are in situations where there's not a lot of space for us to choose. But I guess I picked being an artist because I that's a place where I could be more comfortable. You know, I just, I don't know, guys. I, I spend a lot of time living with all of these languages inside of me. I grew up poor, working with a bunch of dudes who didn't go to college. I spent more time with them than I did with any of my professors. I grew up with Spanish in my ear. I grew up with English in my ear. I grew up with black English in my ear. I grew up in university with kids talking mad smart. And all of those things are present in me. I think, I, think I, I try to find a place where all of these languages can live inside of me. And not everybody is comfortable with them. Not everybody is comfortable with me speaking Spanish. Not everybody is comfortable with me being marked by my class and by my place. And not everybody is comfortable with me sounding smart. We all have our trigger points. Oh, pero te priven inteligente. You know, like, oh, pero tú crees que tú eres alguien. But for me, I just needed to find a place where all of my languages could exist simultaneously, where they could be together. And everybody's always tried in my whole life to tell me one of these languages should not be present. When I was hanging out with my friends at home, if I talked about books, you sound too fucking smart. If I was at home and my mom would hear me speak my busted up Spanish, she'd be like, este maldito gringo, you know? <laughs> Like all of these crazy stuff. And I grew up with every one of my tongues being a problem. And I guess I wanted to figure out a way I could live a life where my tongues, none of them are a problem. 
And I think being this kind of artist helped, you know, and being in a situation like this, but you don't sound like this at your job. There are results to talking certain ways. And I think some of us can bear those consequences, but one should be aware. If you're in an environment that's one kind of language, perhaps you should try to figure out a way to deal with that. And I guess that's been my life, but I'm tired of not feeling at home. And so any chance I get, I try to be at least a little bit at home. You know? Anyway, thank you guys. We're all done. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, thank you for speaking all of your voices here. Um, Juno has graciously agreed to stay behind for a short period of time and sign books. If you don't currently have one of his bestsellers, you can get them at our bookstore located just outside the uh, chamber. And I think he's going to come right up here in the front so that uh, if you have a book and you would like him to sign, some, one of our staff members will directly. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope you will come to more of our programs. On next Sunday at 4 p.m., our Senator Elizabeth Warren will talk about common goals. Thank you. Thank you.